Okay. I think we're ready to get it started. Um, welcome to this event in the Journeys to American Identity series program year. This series is part of the new Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service located on our campus and affiliated with the UW Colleges and UW Extension whose mission is to enhance the civic life of communities throughout Wisconsin with educational outreach, internships and service learning opportunities, public scholarship, nonpartisan public dialogue, and dissemination of ideas generated through research and programming. WIPS would like to acknowledge the generous financial support of the Wisconsin Humanities Council, the UWMC Student Life and Interest Committee, the Alexander Foundation, the B.A. and Esther Greenheck Foundation, the UW System Institute on Race and Ethnicity, and the WIPS inaugural donors. Tonight, we would like to welcome Anja Petty, Assistant Director and Outreach Specialist for the Max Cotty Institute for German American Studies. Ms. Petty holds a master's degree in Germanics from the University of Washington and has been a presenter for historical societies and a workshop leader for K-12 teachers. I would also like to invite you after the question and answer session concluding tonight's lecture to drop your completed evaluation forms in the box by the theater exit. Um, these surveys help to track our program and allow us to do a better job uh, in the future. And you're also invited to a reception in the terrace room just out the door and to the right uh, where we'll have a chance to mingle with the speaker and share conversation cookies and punch. And please plan to attend the next event in the Journeys to American Identity series, Contemporary Immigration Patterns by the Hmong, presented by Dr. Chia Vang, Assistant Professor of History at UW-Milwaukee, scheduled for this Thursday, March 6th at 7 p.m. in the UWMC Theater. So again, welcome Ancha Petty. Thank you, Brett, for the nice introduction, and thank you, Jean Greenberg, and everybody else here for inviting me to this exciting program. Um, yeah, I'm very glad to be back in Warsaw after having been here for the first time in, in November with our Wisconsin English presentation. And I'm happy to talk about the German-speaking immigrants in Wisconsin tonight. Maybe I should say a few things about our institute. Uh, we are the Max Carter Institute at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. We are part of the College of Letters and Science. I have brochures of, about us here and actually lots of other materials which are free for you to take um, or look at if you want. Um, we are an interdisciplinary institute. We do research and outreach on German immigration. Uh, the, and the German-American experience kind of in the larger context of global migration, past and present. Uh, one of our most distinct uh, features is uh, library and archive. Uh, the library is probably one of the largest in the world of German language publications printed in North America. That's our little niche. And archival materials, um, primary sources, letters, photos, diaries, and so forth. Uh, related to German American immigration. We also have a sound archive which is uh, developing rapidly of German dialects and German languages being spoken in North America. Uh, that the earliest recordings go back to the early 40s and we just came out with a CD this one. Um, if you want to take some dialect samples of heritage speakers, speakers who today still speak these dialects in the United States in the second, third, fourth, and fifth generations. And it's transcribed in English and also in standard German. We are open to the public. We are not a lending library, but feel free to visit us anytime. Uh, we are in this little house on the west side of campus right next to University Hospital, if anybody knows the place. We also have a website you could check out and um, lots of things, lots of virtual exhibits and lots of our things are online, um, including the library catalog. So if you look for something specific, you can look there before you head out to Madison, try to find it in our institute. Yeah, today um, I would like to talk about the German-speaking immigrants. And here I say German-speaking because when 
most of these people emigrated. There was no such country or nation as Germany. They come, came from all kinds of states in Central Europe. Um, but they had one thing in common. They spoke various German languages and dialects. So from now on, probably just to keep it shorter, I say German, but keep in mind the very diverse background. Yeah, who were they? Where did they come from? When and why? What was their immigration experience? The languages and dialects they spoke? And then what marks did they leave on Wisconsin and maybe this area? Just an overview. This is uh, a map of the 2000 census. And um, as you can see, 42.7% of Wisconsinites self-identified as primarily of German ancestry. And uh, which puts Wisconsin right after North Dakota percentage-wise and puts us square in what we call the buckle of the German belt. Let me see if I can work this here. See the whole area. Doesn't, oh, there it is, okay. <laughs> in, in Wisconsin itself, uh, just a quick look at the distribution. You can see that most people who claim German ancestry live on the Michigan shoreline, Milwaukee area, all the way up. And then, of course, um, right here, Marathon County is also in one of the islands of um, over 57% German ancestry. In absolute numbers, what does that mean? Uh, nationwide, 15% of uh, population claims German ancestry, uh, which is the highest of all ethnic groups. And it's uh, no wonder if you look at the 19th century immigration statistics, basically from 1830 till 1900, um, Germ people from German lands were about 25 or even over a third of the immigrant population. And in absolute numbers, it's in the hundreds and thousands and even almost one and a half million just in the 1880s. Um, however, unlike some other groups who came, uh, German-speaking immigrants were a very uh, unhomogeneous group for various reasons. Um, most, for one reason, the time of immigration, uh, mostly the region they came from, um, the languages and dialects were different, the educational and socioeconomic background is different. Uh, they had different religions uh, and uh, different cultures where they came from. And all of that influenced the regions they migrated to in the United States and in the long term created different regional cultures. Oops. Um, they came to Wisconsin and also uh, nationwide in three larger waves. The first wave, let me go back real quick. There. Uh, was from southwestern Germany. What did I do? <laughs> Thank you. Um, came in the 1850s. Then a second wave in the 1860s from northwestern Germany, and uh, the last, the largest wave in the 18, or especially early 1880s from the eastern part. What's in, for these purposes considered southwestern Germany, especially Bavaria, the states to the oh, Uh, the states to the west, like uh, the Rhineland area, Hesse, um, and so forth. Also into Switzerland and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, northwestern would be Saxonia, Thuringia, and the east, uh, mostly actually the coastline regions of Pomerania, up into Schleswig-Holstein almost, and uh, to the south, Silesia. Um, these waves, as I said, were quite different. The first one um, the south, from the southwest were mostly small farmers, uh, lots of artisans, merchants, and also intellectuals um, and 
uh, others who had wanted to leave Germany after the failed revolutions of 1848-49. Uh, second group is kind of similar in socioeconomic um, basis from the uh, northwestern states, also usually small landowners and um, lots of tradesmen. Third wave was a little different. Um, immigrants in general, and this is all very generalized, um, were more from the poorer regions of the northeast. By then, um, immigration itself had changed. Not so many families emigrated more. It were a lot of single people. Actually, in some years, two-thirds of the immigrants from this area were single. Um, came as uh, laborers, usually worked in the industrial cities here in Milwaukee or in Chicago or also on the East Coast. Um, also, a large group of Russian German immigrants who came at that time with the eastern wave of immigrants. So, uh, I want to talk a little bit about why people make this decision to leave and where to go, and want to refer to some of the things from our archives on that. It's a huge decision to leave your homeland and consider not to go back. Why would you do that and why would you not stay? Uh, some people don't have a choice, war refugees, people who are forced uh, to leave and are resettled. But many others actually did have a choice. And for the uh, immigrants in the 19th century who came from the German-speaking areas, um, they came very purposefully and often in very planned immigrations. Uh, some people at that time, and especially even a century earlier from Germany, were shipped out by their home states. There was an um, interesting concept that some states and cities and towns decided that some people, criminals and uh, others, were better off on the other side of the Atlantic. They paid the shippage and just sent them over, but those were individuals. Um, people mostly, especially in these uh, first and second waves, um, always actually came for economic reasons. And not necessarily because they were dirt poor, but because they were um, looking to better their lot in life for themselves and their children. Uh, here's an example from a, a farmer who came from Rhein Hesse State, who in Rhein Hesse had a pretty decent farm, but at that time in the early 1850s, uh, the birth rate was very high. The, inheritance laws in that region are such that every child gets an equal part. So if you have a, even a bigger farm, and the big there means small in uh, American context, divided up by several children, it's not viable for any of them. So he said, I might be considered a wealthy man here where I live, but I have nine children. Upon my death, each of them would receive only 1,500 gilder which in this country would mean poverty. They could not hope to ever earn enough to, leave, uh, to live without pressing worries. I prefer to leave for North America with the little that I can salvage here. There I will purchase for my family a big homestead with relatively little money in order to provide them with a future free of worries. And so you see the idea of getting land and have a future free of worries was the dream of those immigrants. Um, and America seemed to provide that. Some people um, came for religious reasons, not so much at that time, especially not to Wisconsin. There are some groups, like the earlier, early group of Pomeranians who settled in the Freistadt area, the so-called Old Lutherans, who wanted to leave Prussia when uh, the evangelical and Lutheran churches were combined there. But mostly, even though religion often played a very important role once they were here, it was not often the primary reason for emigration. Often, even more so than economic situation was plain personal situations, and I will refer to some of those later. So how do you decide where to go? Um, when you live in America, since uh, if you're not an immigrant like myself, most of us have ancestors who came earlier, and it's hard to imagine that they had other choices. It seems so natural that everybody came to America. But the choices were vast, actually. Uh, by the mid-19th century, emigration was a business, uh, developing into a big force of po uh, population movement in Germany, in the German states. Uh, there were books about, advice books on immigration, uh, magazines and journals that only dealt with that topic. 
And here is a book from our collection. It's called The Ratgeber for Auswanderungslustige, uh, the advice book for those who would enjoy to emigrate. It's from 1847, it's 500 pages. It covers every part of the world in great detail. And on the cover it says, does, can anybody read this? <laughs> it's in the Fraktur, it says, where it, uh, how and where to would you like to emigrate? To the United States or to no British North America? to the country on the other side of the Rocky Mountains, or California, uh, to the free state of Texas, to Santa Thomas or the Mosquito Coast, to South America or the West Indies, to Africa or Asia, South Australia or New Zealand. Would you like to go to Russia or Poland, to Hungary or Siebenbürgen, that's today in Romania, Serbia or Greece, or would it be better if you used your energy and uh, invested it to cultivate your fatherland? And then the book gives the various options. And um, thank you. <laughs> the section uh, of Wisconsin is in there. Look, this, look at the spelling. Yeah. Um, it has several pages, quite detailed. <laughs> Madison is mentioned as the capital with 490 inhabitants. Look what's printed in biggest print, the lead mines you know, um, near Mineral Point. That, at that point was the industry that uh, drew labor and was well known in, in Germany, so people headed there. Um, it said, north of the line from, from Green Bay to the Mississippi River, nothing has happened yet in 1847. It's total wilderness. So can you find Wasser in there? Uh, yeah, am I right? Kind of there, probably. So people before they left knew quite well where they would go. Um, the state of Wisconsin at time of statehood was empty and was wanted people to settle here and was actively engaged in promoting um, people to settle here. And actually from 1852 to 1855 had an office of emigration, not immigration, but emigration. We had an emigration officer whose sole purpose was to grab those emigrants at the point when they were willing to leave their home countries, but before they had made a decision where to go and steer them towards Wisconsin versus Illinois or Kansas or the East Coast or wherever. So this office had a, um, of emigration, the Wisconsin Office of Emigration, had a station in New York where they grabbed people off the ships, they published in German newspapers, they published in German-American newspapers, advertising the state. Why in German papers? Uh, because at that time, it was Germans from southwestern Germany who uh, were willing to emigrate. That was the population in Europe who was going to leave and also had some capital and, and was, uh, had the means, like this farmer I cited, to actually purchase land here and do something with it. Um, so they say in their publication, how wonderful it is here. Uh, he writes letters in the German-American papers urging other German-Americans to write home and say, this is a quote now, a translate from the German, um, that Wisconsin is the healthiest state in the union. It has the, most, the best and most fertile soil, has the best timber and best waterways. In contrast to other states in, in the union, it does not have any significant debts. And Wisconsin has one of the most liberal constitutions, which puts the immigrant on equal footing with native-born citizens, um, meaning Yankees. Um, for example, you could vote very quickly after he moved into the state. Um, the railroad got into the business in the 1870s, and that contributed largely to settlement here and in these parts of the state. Um, after having got the federal land grants, uh, they sold off some of their land to make the production possible and sold this off to immigrants. This is a promotional card that's bilingual, and if you look at it, actually it's, the German is not a translation of the English. The English just say, send your address to the land commission of the Wisconsin Central Railroad. Um, the German urges German Americans to send this card to Europe to their friends and acquaintances and have them contact this agent in Basel, Switzerland to get more information on the wonderful state. But the most um, convincing thing, as in emigration all over the world at all times, were personal letters and personal accounts, because people like to go 
where they know someone, where they have a safety network, uh, where they're amongst their own. So letters and personal accounts uh, yeah, contributed largest to where people decided to go actually. And that's still the case with uh, immigration populations so today. I understand the Hmong who moved in the Warsaw Madison areas. It's um, largely the case because early Hmong people were settled here. So we have tons of letters and um, dozens and dozens of um, communication in our archives, all extremely interesting. And you see a certain pattern. If someone comes first of a family, they immediately write back and write how wonderful it is and try to draw their family and friends. Um, I would just uh, use two family examples here. One is the Fauci family, which we have in our archives, and which is all the letters are actually also on our website in translation if you would like to read them. And the other one is the Sternberger family. Um, Fauci started with uh, Johann Jakob, who came in 1852 from Saan in Switzerland. That's uh, near Bern, and uh, settled in Sauk City in a group of other with a group of other Swiss immigrants. So a couple of weeks after he arrived here, he writes home. Um, the first part of the letter describes the long trip, the journey, and so forth. And then he raves about his new farm. Thanks be to God, all four of us are well and safe and sound in a healthy land. This region is very good for cattle. I have bought two cows and two oxen and have in mind to purchase another five or six cows next spring. Around here, the land is open for the most part. I have not had much time for gathering hay because I've been busy building my housing. In this neighborhood where I have settled, there is good land and good water. For I have bought 80 acres with two springs, 80 acres for $100. I've built a house on it with two rooms, a cellar and upstairs. And on and on he goes. And the, that he doesn't have to buy feed for the cow for the winter because the hay is so plenty and all the vegetables he can grow. And, there's a, also a valley stream here so that everyone can manufacture with his own sawmill. This valley is two hours long and there are only two inhabitants. Uh, I left and right there hills, mountains and valleys with no one living there. Um, for the most part, the people are German and Swiss. The greater number of families are from, from the Kanton Graubünden and from Diemtingen, the most evangelical people. So that's very close to the home country. Again, that would be an incentive for others to come. Um, Jakob Sternberger is one of those 48ers. Uh, he was a student uh, at the Park University in Bohemia, studied law and uh, mining engineering. Comes from a rather prominent family in the city of Kadan, which is today in the Czech Republic, just south of the German border. His grandfather was the first mayor of that city. Um, his uh, original name was Jakob von Sternberger. He dropped the aristocratic von uh, as a student. And when the revolution failed, he, with his cousin and some um, student friends, came to the United States. Um, and he also writes a long letter. We have the last 21 pages of the letter, uh, which starts when he's already purchasing his land here. Uh, he refers to earlier parts where he describes the journey, so I think we miss at least another 21 pages of a long letter, unfortunately. But it's very interesting. Um, he has some means and uh, brings money with him, so he's actually able to purchase so-called developed land, uh, a Norwegian that a Norwegian is selling who had built a house on it and had cleared the trees and the forest. And he also writes at the end of this long letter how everybody um, should follow him. Um, so this would be a classic, um, people follow these uh, people. Yeah, uh, Johan, Jakob Fauci is followed by his nephews. And uh, I will go to get to Sternberg a little bit later. Uh, it's what we call chain migration. It usually happens within one generation when one person or one group starts and others follow to the same place. And that's uh, by far the most common form of migration for the Germans here in Wisconsin. And also uh, probably for the Pomeranians in Marathon County. Also, uh, another phenomenon is multiple migration, or in German we say Wandermigration, uh, where groups move to one place and then often decades or, uh, or years, but sometimes a generation or two later, move on to another place for various reasons. And a uh, very good example for that are the Mennonites um, throughout North America and actually South America now, who from Holland to um, Eastern Germany to Russia to Canada to the United States to 
all the way to Bolivia, now moved over several hundred years. But also smaller groups, for example, as I understand, a group of Pittsburgh German Catholics who settled here in Marathon County, who originally came from southwestern Germany, spent in, in the 1840s, settled in Pittsburgh, were laborers uh, there in the industry, and then decided to come here. Another interesting phenomenon we find in Wisconsin are emigration societies, and the best example is probably um, the founding of New Glarus. Uh, when, yeah, um, at the beginning of industrialization in Central Europe, uh, overpopulation, some communities decided to purposefully resettle some of their population in the United States. And so the Canton Glarus in Switzerland had an emigration society where the Canton bought, sent out some scouts to find land, which they found near Nuglaus, paid for the land. Each member of the group um, had 10 years to pay the land off without interest. Um, and the whole community structure was such that actually for those 10 years, no foreigner, and that included someone who wasn't from Canton uh, Glarus, yeah, even from another part of Switzerland, was not allowed to settle in New Glarus at that time. Um, yeah, here, Marathon County, the two major groups, the earlier one, the Pittsburgh Germans. Um, and then, um, who's um, settled in Marathon City, and you know all more about it than I do, I'm sure. Uh, August Kickbush is credited as being the initiator of a wave of uh, Pomeranian immigrants. He came to Wisconsin 1857, the same time as the um, Pittsburgh German settlement started here. He bought some land, but then uh, stayed in Milwaukee for three years, eventually started a business of trading and, and pioneer goods, and uh, realized the lack of population, and in 1867 returned to Pomerania within three months, gathered over 700 people, hired a steamer, and brought him over to the United States and within 12 days from New York straight to Warsaw. And many of these people worked in his various businesses, others bought land, and that again triggered more family members and friends coming after him, so a classic example of chain migration to this area. Um, as I said earlier, people like to settle where they knew people, knew people and that is often very regional. Um, you can see on cemeteries, the early settlers, they not only came from the same country or same state, uh, they came from the same village or sub-village. Um, I understand that the Pittsburgh Germans and the Pomeranians, there was a certain dividing line for generations here in the area. Uh, same can be said for cities in Milwaukee. Uh, I was told by an elderly lady who grew up in the Austrian German community in, in Milwaukee as that it was a big scandal in the early 30s when she was a child. The first mixed marriage happened and that was between an Austrian German and an Italian. So there was not much <laughs> contact at that time. Um, so as I said earlier, most people here for, in Wisconsin, especially the earlier two waves, uh, came to have land. The dream of independence that came with owning land. And everybody tried themselves at farm, farming. However, it was not as easy as it seemed, as it was portrayed, for example, by uh, Johann Fauci in his letter. For starters, um, even though coming here was a certain equalizer um, in terms of social status, uh, financial background still mattered. Someone who came with money like uh, Jakob Sternberg could immediately buy a farm. Someone who barely could pay for ship it had to work and labor here for years before they could farm. Some of these Pittsburgh immigrants could barely buy their land, but still had to work in the lumber industry to, to make it work. So that's the first step. Uh, many people, including the whole group from New Glarus, had never farmed before. Yeah, the New Glarus people uh, worked in the textile industry. So farming itself was totally new. And then farming here was, even for those who had farmed in Germany, was very, very new. The land was different, it was virgin land, nobody had seen such thing in Europe. Acreage, just the vast amount of the land, the distances, yeah, the isolation of living in the farm. Climate is different, different crops, um, 
different farming practices have to be implied. So the immigrants usually very quickly adapted to the local farming um, techniques and, and customs. Um, we have dozens, dozens, and uh, yeah, at least, of guidebooks for farming in North America in our collection that shows you what a challenge it was. So the publishers here in the United States printed special books of guidebooks just for German American farmers, uh, sh showing the differences. Uh, the household rural households were different than in Germany. For women, it was quite a different experience living here on a on a farm away from any town or village. Um, this quote from a cookbook here that was published by Bromda in 1897 in Milwaukee for German immigrants. And in the bread section where they discuss the various German bread recipes, the introduction says, old settlers remember the days when in many farmsteads there were no cast iron ovens. Bread had to be, to be baked in cast iron pots, which had cast iron lids. Such a pot, called a Dutch oven, had to be placed in an open fireplace onto glowing coal. Even the lid had to be covered with red hot coal. Baking required a lot of care. Women suffered greatly from the embers of the open fire. That was new. Yeah, in, in Germany, uh, if you baked bread, uh, there, there were bakers in the towns and the cities, and even in, on farms, often you brought your dough to the baker and he baked it for you and so forth. So this whole idea of sitting there with a cast iron oven, very different. That's just one teeny tiny example. Um, labor was different, the availability or the lack of uh, helping hands, um, and then the business of farming, totally different. Uh, even if people had farmed in Germany, it was not the same as running a business here. So again, we have lots of books that just deal with the business of, of the farming side. And here is one very picture, um, it says down there, the man who pays his mortgage on time. Yeah, this whole concept of buying land on, and mortgage, not that common in Europe at that time. So that's what his farm looks like, yeah? Nice and successful. Here is the man who doesn't pay his mortgage on time. That's how he will wind up. <laughs> not so good. Um, this is a foreclosure, okay, explaining for the concept of foreclosure. The old couple there has to foreclose on its farm because they gave money to their son, lent, lent money to their son. And then the court says, now go over the hill to the poor house. And there's a whole new business idea that actually, in particular that book, um, this, what German farmers actually often decry at that time, that's the Yankee sense of business. Big profit, all by yourself, even to the exclusion of your own son. It gets really drummed into people in this book. Um, so not, ev not everybody tried farming. Some people were tradespeople and um, wound up in the cities from the beginning, and others tried the hand and failed, um, like um, Jakob Schernberger, for example, over a couple of years, his farm failed miserably, and he decided to go back to his old law experience, and he became a teacher and actually a judge after a while in, in Mayville. For, Others, like Christian Frauci, one of the nephews of, of Johann who came, um, was a, ca a cabinet maker by trade. And he and his brother tried farming, didn't have enough money, had to work, never really got enough money together to purchase land uh, after decades he did. Christian, after a while, decided it wasn't for him and he would go back to the carpentry and bought um, a coffin making business in Madison. <laughs> and in he came to the, um, in 1867, he came to the United States, so two years later he buys this business, and he writes home to his parents, and you can tell from other parts of the letter that the parents are pretty aghast that he didn't buy land, but a coffin-making business. Uh, so he says, two years ago, I myself had a view toward going into farming, but everyone laughed at me. Then I decided to devote the rest of my days to my profession. Although cabinet-making work is very poorly paid here because there are so many factories, Indeed, I would have been able to establish myself just as well in Europe. And carpentry offers employment here only during the summer, but my present business pays materially better. But it seems to me if one has lived for 12 years abroad, as I have, he was actually uh, wandering through Europe, mostly France and places like wandering tradesmen, which was very common at that time in, in Europe. Um, 
if one has lived in Europe for 12 years, uh, abroad for 12 years, as I have under the authority of others, it is his duty and mission to become independent. So here he could just buy this business and get independent in Germany, uh, not, not just in Germany, Switzerland, all those countries he would have had to get a certain master designation, which again was expensive. He couldn't just buy his business, so there's this kind of opportunity here. And of course he became very successful. Um, he also says, I carry on my business with a certain amount of anxiety, chiefly because it involves writing in English, and he actually underlines that, for I have to deal with English businessmen in other cities. For example, from New York, I order metal coffins, lacquer, varnish, and the like. From Connecticut and Cincinnati, silver and upholstering materials and the like for fitting up the coffins. From Chicago, Milwaukee, walnut, and other types of wood. Although I'm still weak at writing English, so far I have had no delays. But having business letters written by others is not done here. If one does that, he doesn't look like a businessman. And so I contrive as best as I can. And again, going back to these business advice books for all kinds of businesses there. There are pages and pages of sample letters yeah, for various business transactions for the, it was just to, to copy. Um, yeah, and that brings me right back to language. Um, yeah, here's just a, I will not go into the cities that much, but um, equal representation there. First um, pharmacy in Wisconsin was the Deutsche Apotheke. That's the Milwaukee. And today we still, still see the remnants, that's in Milwaukee Third Street, the old uh, Whole Food Music store, and the Miller Light truck there, of course, Friedrich Müller, or Frederick Miller, was a German immigrant who didn't have anything to do with beer making in his home country, but seized a business opportunity when he came to Milwaukee. Um, yeah, the thing with German, um, the question is what German did they speak? Uh, Low or high German, dialect or language, how many languages or dialects. Um, most people in their homes spoke a form of uh, dialect. And in school, the written language and in church was high German or standard German. So most of them at that time in Germany, if they were, when they were literate, and most of them were actually, were kind of bilingual already. Uh, coming here to the United States, English was added into the mix, like with Christian Fauci. Now he learns English. Um, to clarify about the low German, low German does not mean it's lesser German. Uh, it just is, what my little pointer here. It's the dialects that are spoken in the geographic lowlands. If you had a um, map of Germany, you would see this is on the coastline, the, the middle range mountains, and the Alps in the south. Um, the middle German dialects that include um, this region, and then the high German dialects, including Bavarian, Swabian, and so forth, are what linguists call high German. It's a bit of a confusion because the standard German that's today, that's taught in schools, is also often called high German, um, but it's not the same linguistically. So wherever they came, they settled there, spoke these languages. And today we still have speaker of these languages in the whatever generation, second, third, fourth, fifth. They are rapidly disappearing, though. There are only very few speakers of Kirsch, the dialect of the Cologne area left in, um, in Dane County. Probably no more the, of the original heritage speakers of uh, Glarus Swiss German, but still quite a few Pomeranian speakers, and I'm sure there are some here tonight. So, um, and Pomeranian is extremely interesting because that is a dialect that is dying out and has died out much quicker in Germany now. It's not spoken anymore, but it's here still maintained to a certain degree uh, in a version that is the 19th century version with some English sprinkled in. Um, we have this website, you can link to it from our website, we created this program of American languages, including the German dialect. Um, you can click your way through it, hear some sound samples, get uh, the translation both into the, um, actually the website only has the English translation, our, our CD also has a standard German one. Um, but, but we have examples of Pennsylvania Dutch, um, 
Pommage, Letzeburgisch, Luxembourg dialect, and various others on there. If you're interested. That's the actual website address, but it's also directly linkable from our website, mki.wis.edu. Yeah, uh, how much time do we have? Maybe do the next one. Could we play the sound sample? This is a. Oh. Well, that's what she says. Who understood that? <laughs> ah, super. <laughs> That's from our German spoken here in Marathon County uh, from an interview from 1968. A speaker was born in 1903. The interview was done by our former director, Jürgen Eichhoff, and it's part of our collection. It's also on this CD. Um, so the interesting thing, she says, did anybody read through it? There's, um, she talks about speaking low German, high German, and then also English. And the point she makes it, that at some, uh, it was very hard for her to go to school because first day of school she had to learn high German. It was basically like a foreign language to her. So to make life for her kids easier, she starts speaking high German with them. And notice, not English, but high German. Yeah, and I don't know, she's born 1903, her kids went to school maybe in the late 20s or, or 30s. Um, that's that the spoken language and then the written language, I said, is standardized in standard German. Very few dialects have a written language and mostly it's, just, it's actually created rather recently now in Germany. But new challenges, the print and the script. Um, this is the Fraktur print. Pretty easy to read if you read German. Yeah, you learn a few characters. But this is the script. And anybody who has done German genealogy found some letters. It's an example from our library. Uh, not only is it in the old script, it's cross-written. Uh, this is not the back shining through. Yeah, it's purposely written. Actually, the back is the same to save space. And that was done quite frequently. So can anybody read this? <laughs> says, my liebes Matildchen, my dear little Matilde. And that's as far as we got, so we're still looking for a volunteer who wants to transcribe this one. Um, so then imagine the children going to school. Right? Um, this is a reader for a German-American school. Lots of schools taught in German, not just religious or private schools, but public schools. And actually, through so all years, it kind of depends on the region. Um, some had uh, the main subjects in English, some started English in the later years, but German was very common and actually was advertised also by the M Office of Immigration that you te could teach and um, educate and preach in your own language. And people were very adamant about it. In fact, when in 1888, um, there was some anti-immigrant sentiment and uh, one, I think it was a congressman in Wisconsin, uh, Bennett, tried to, uh, or actually succeeded for two years to have a law uh, put through that the main subjects could only be taught in English to get a valid degree, a school degree. That was really an outcry among the Germans and actually also other ethnic groups. Um, so this concept that you teach in languages other than English in the 19th century was very much developed and it did not mean you were less a pa patriot for it. People were very American, very proud to be American but didn't see anything wrong with speaking another language and being a good American. Uh, whoops, no, I didn't mean that to do that. Let's go to back. And one example, for example, this is a school book. Kids learning the alphabet in German for an American school. It's actually printed in the early 1900s. Little children learn the word Fahne for flag. And how can you tell it was not 
printed in Germany and just imported. It has the American flag. Yeah? So no problem with uh, being very American and speaking German, teaching your kids German. Uh, this is the report card of, of Frieda um, Horning from the Evangelical Lutheran Shul School in Menominee. And I don't have the date on here. All, all subjects in German. Uh, but back to the little reader, uh, the challenge of it. So they learn the German print, this looks like this. Le they learn the German script, which looks like that. They learn the American print, and actually the American or the English print, the script is also different. Uh, so imagine being a little six-year-old going to school at the German-American at that time, what an experience it was. They were multilingual. Uh, this is the same sentence down here as that sentence. There is an eagle. Da ist ein Adler. This is how different it looks. And here is a little girl, um, Ilma Bublitz, who in, I think it's 1909 practices writing the script. Which letter is she practicing? What's the capital letter? Hmm? Nope. B. Okay. That's the capital B. Oops. Oop. So you see the potential for confusion. <laughs> can, can anybody read the words up there? It's this Baum, tree, tree, Brille, glasses, Büßer, sinner, and Burde, um, obligation. Um, language, yeah, there was a German language Life, German language permeated all aspects of life, um, social life, leisure life, and I just saw a few images here. On each of these, one could give an hour-long talk. Um, Germans had all kinds of society, the, uh, this concept of a club uh, to rally around a certain area of interest, be it music or gymnastics, the uh, term Verein in German, um, was very strong in the 19th century. So here's, whoop, huh. The Warsaw Liederkranz, yeah, the Singer's Circle in 1884. Uh, theater in Milwaukee, churches held German language services. Um, there are still some today who will give them on special occasions or special Christmas services. Um, the Turners, uh, a gymnastic group, Turner means gymnast in German, um, who in the United States kind of had a double function and uh, in the 19th century Germany a very strong health movement, um, back to nature, stay fit, it was so gymnastic was very, very important. And it was also a place to congregate for people around the, yeah, in the 1840s before the revolution outside of other social circles, mainly the ch churches and so forth. So, when the immigrants came here, a lot of Turner societies also had a social function or political function, um, which is totally lost in Germany today. If you ask a German what is the Turner or Turnverein, they just say gymnasts. But in Milwaukee today, the Turner still have their uh, for street forum, so uh, very socially engaged. That's still part of that history. Mm. Food. Um, People brought their language and various cultural aspects, but immediately applied it to the new surroundings. And food is actually a very, and uh, the general cuisine is a very interesting example. Again, I could talk an hour about just how the cookbooks change from generation to generation and edition to edition. Uh, like with farming and business, uh, you also had to adjust your feeding, uh, um, your food. Certain ingredients weren't here, kind of wasn't here, you couldn't prepare them the same way. So again, lots and lots of cookbooks were printed, especially for the German-American needs. People brought their own recipes. Um, and in these publications, um, again, this is the Brumda book, the 1879 edition of his book for German-Americans. I think he summarizes pretty well what the general sentiment was. Um, it's called, uh, a practical, the, the practices I covered there, but practical cookbook for the Germans in America. And um, 
he says, this is a German cookbook in America. A German cookbook in America should not be German or American, but German-American. It should retain the excellence, wholesomeness, and taste of German cuisine while simultaneously not neglecting the equally good native, and he means American cuisine, or the climate and products of our American homeland. So it has lots of German recipes, lots of adaptations, and actually quite a few American recipes in it too. So what for you would be a typical German dish, if I would ask you? Uh, Sauerkraut, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> With dumplings, Schweinhäufchen, okay. Apfelkuchen, okay. Rouladen, okay. Rotkohl. Grün, oh, so that's different. I was waiting for that. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, almost aside from the green coal, any, everything you mentioned are dishes from the south of Germany, the southwestern corner. Basically, dishes the very first wave of immigrants would have brought here. And that is very interesting. That goes for all kinds of typical German things, the dress, the dirndl, you yeah, have southern Germany, the food. And for, so the German-American traditions have, are the ones that are based on this first wave of, of, of immigrants. Why is that? Um, yeah, scholars are debating that, but there seems to be um, sort of consensus that the first group is the one that established itself. Uh, when the following group came, they uh, plugged into that network. The outside considered them all German. They didn't make a difference between some of from Westphalia versus from Bavaria versus from Pomerania. So that slowly the other inferences from the later groups, even if they were more numerous, as was the case here in Wisconsin, kind of got to a certain degree absorbed by that first group. Um, I had n never had a Sauerbraten before I came here. I'm from northern Germany, yeah, but every German restaurant here has a Sauerbraten. I grew up with things like the stuff up there, good old, perfectly great it's fruit soup, um, also called Rote Grütze. No, Kirschensuppe, exactly, cherry soup. It's considered Schwarzauer. Norwegian here. Schwarzsauer, <laughs> that's close to this. <laughs> So, but for some reason, even though the cookbooks, the early ones, have all these recipes in them, um, it has faded from the American, German-American tradition, and people are not aware of it. Same with the breads. There were do dozens and dozens and dozens of breads in there, uh, with all grains, all sourdough, all variations. There's only one German bread that really has made it into the American main mainstream. Which one is that? the bretzel. Um, again, that's from a very, you find it in every mall now. It's Americanized, you find it with cheese on top and so forth. But it's a very, used to be a very, the salt bretzel used to be a very regional dish in south, in a very small region of southwestern Germany and the Alsace, which is now uh, in France. So it's, again, very interesting how that has made it into the mainstream. And in Wisconsin, of course, the brat has made it into the mainstream and the beer and so forth. Um, yeah, what happened to the language? Um, in the census of uh, 1900, or deducting from it, one can assume that 30% of the people in Wisconsin spoke German as their household language and primary language. That was the height of um, German immigration, and also the older speakers of the first two waves of immigrants were still alive, so this was probably the time when most people spoke German as their first language. Today, in uh, 2000, it's just under 1%. And it's probably mostly people like me. Um, and a few Pomeranian speakers. So uh, however, there's one group that kept German going over generations, and that's not diminishing like all the other heritage languages, but it's actually growing. And those are the Amish um, speaking Pennsylvania Dutch, which now has been classified as a language of its own. It's the dialect of the Palatine, actually, around the region of Kaiserslautern, uh, with about 15% of English mixed in now, in some variations. Um, when these people came in the 18th century to Pennsylvania, uh, they were yeah, a group of Palatine immigrants, and the, actually the Amish, or the old, the old older Amish and Mennonites were under 4% of that um, 
that Palatine dialect speaking group. Uh, however, the other uh, more secular or not old order groups uh, lost the dialect or the, uh, the language as any other immigrant groups have in the 20th century, but for the Amish, where it's, the language is an integral part of their community and their life, and because they have such high birth rates, they're basically doubling every, every 25 years. This is one of two heritage languages that are going, or immigrant languages that are going from generation to generation in this country. Someone want to guess what the other one is? It's not Spanish. We have so many Spanish speakers because there's continuous immig uh, immigration from first generation speakers. The same with the Germans. We had more and more speakers from yeah, 1840 to 1900 because of new immigration. Um, but Spanish speakers lose uh, the language ability in the second generation and uh, definitely in the third. It's the um, um, Yiddish speakers among the Hasidic Jews on the East Coast in New York here. So these two groups are actually the only groups over, who over generations are growing heritage speakers. Um, yeah, what does it mean, German-American identity? And since this is about identity, um, I had an per interesting personal experience whenever, yeah, when I came to this country and people said, where are you from? I said, from Germany. I said, oh, I'm German too. And I immediately spoke German to them until I realized that's not what they mean. <laughs> they mean their background. That's a very American concept. The fact that the census even asks for heritage. Um, the few other countries in the world that I know of that have censuses, nobody asks for her heritage. Uh, my family background is actually Danish. My maiden name is Danish. If someone asked me what I, I would never say I'm Danish. <laughs> uh, I don't speak the language. I'm too far removed. But in America, there's a very concrete sense of ethnic identity, and it's self-defined and redefined. Um, the census themselves are critical. How do you decide what your primary ancestry is? Most people today have mixed ancestry. What, how do you make that decision? Um, what is German-American? I already talked about the food. What items do you grab to yeah, create that identity? Um, on the other hand, this really neat thing has happened in this country where all these ethnic identities kind of merged into a regional identity or yeah, regional culture. And especially in the Midwest, uh, where the German has an influence, it's quite interesting. So. Um, you see it in festivals and the foods, um, the heritage societies that exist. Uh, for the Germans, but if, yeah, the Irish celebrate St. Patrick's Day. And um, I'm, maybe I'm ignorant, but I'm not aware that there are different regions of Ireland that celebrate differently. It's an Irish festival. It's celebrated. But Germans have uh, very uh, different heritage groups and in addition to um, celebrating German-American heritage, they more celebrate their regional heritage. So if you go to German Fest, you see Pomeranians and Donau Swabians and people from Bavaria. So there's a strong awareness of the regional cultural background versus the um, national background. Um, the festivals, oops, I think, Again, I'd never been to an Oktoberfest before, before I came to the Midwest. Uh, Oktoberfest is only one place in Germany where it's celebrated, and that's in Munich. Uh, other places in Germany also have fall festivals, and every, every place has one, but they're called Weinfests or Schützenfests and who knows what. But the term Oktoberfest is very much associated with Munich. So, and here in the Midwest, it has become yeah, the default fall festival for a lot of regions. And they sometimes they celebrated in German communities, like here in Oak Park. Sometimes in places like La Crosse, where there's not a huge German community, it's, it has become a Midwestern item. And they do have German or what's considered German-American elements, but also very much um, yeah, the regional elements. So I found this poster from Oak Park, especially interesting, so close outside of Chicago. It has, um, yeah. Polka dance contest, yeah, and Jimmy's Bavarians, but it also has Coco Taylor and her blues machine. So it's a truly American festival. A German who comes to a German fest 
thinks this is the quintessential American fest and not Israel fest. So very fascinating. Yeah, that was my little talk. If you have questions, happy to dance. Thank you. Yeah. I did not know the food uh, things that were mentioned here. Uh -huh. From my personal experience, I did not uh, have that experience. I tasted uh, Zauerbraten and Roladen and those things when I went to an, a bigger city and ate in a restaurant that had that. I think the food that we had here, we don't even think of as German, but it really is. It's, we were here so long it's become, you know, meat and potatoes, roast pork, roast beef, wieners, hot dogs, summer sausage, smoked ham, smoked bacon, and all those things. That's the, the food that I would associate with German food, but we don't think about it that way anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. And F, um, I had hoped for that response because the Pomeranian community, I think it's kind of unique here that you really, this community kept uh, northern German food or general exper uh, cultural experience and without being aware of it, maybe. But in other parts, that's definitely the case. And that's why I was excited when fin finally someone said Grünkohl, because Grünkohl is a very, it's green, it's kale. And how do you prepare the kale? <laughs> um, with oatmeal and, and smoked sausages and so forth. So it's a special dish if you go to Bremen and the north of the coast areas in Germany right now, you find it on every, every uh, restaurant menu, but you would never find that in Bavaria. And so, yeah, these dishes are still, still here in this region. That's very unique about the mar Marathon region, actually. Um, yeah. country identify very strongly with their ethnic background, but I'm not so sure it's directly German as opposed to maybe Russian. Mm -hmm. Would you comment, please? Um, I'm not a total, <laughs> I'm not an expert on that, but um, they came, um, the Volga Germans and also other regions in Russia were settled under Catherine the Great and were mostly people from the region of Swabia, and again, that part of southern Germany, um, 18th century immigration, people who left east, frankly, people who could not afford the uh, passage to America and went to Russia. Um, it, I'm not sure if they still kept their Swabian dialect or spoke a high German. Um, they definitely speak German. Does anybody know? In the 18th in the um, 19th century, when they, like other Russian Germans, emigrated um, after their privileges were taken away under um, Alexander II, uh, they bought land there. Uh, but by then, the land that was available and cheap was west of here, so uh, the Dakotas. And that's where most of them settled. And again, with this re regionalism, they are very, they were very different from the other Germans that had settled here, very different from the Germans who had come from Germany at the same time. It's, it's what I would call another example of wander migration of this um, multiple migration. Uh, a lot of Mennonites were among them, so they kept them themselves um, regionally and yeah, to this day have a very strong identity and have had quite a different immigration experience actually than the ones who, uh, people who settled at the same time in Wisconsin. Does that answer your question? I just wanted to comment on the Volga Germans a little bit. When I was in Argentina on a visit, uh, 
people would identify me as a German for some reason, and uh, they would often speak to me in, uh, in high German, and most of the ones I ran into were Volga Germans. Mm -hmm. They spoke a high German with, a, with some inflection, and they had been there from 1870 or 1880. Mm -hmm. And they farm mostly in Las Pampas and Buenos Aires uh, provinces, right. and uh, with that, there's very lush grass there, and they grow cattle and, and, and very good mm -hmm. crops. And that, that's all I really have to say about. It. Yeah, I think Lawrence Welk, for instance, uh -huh. was a was a Volga German. I think he was from North Dakota. Mm -hmm. One portion of my family came from West Prussia, uh, mm -hmm. Deutsch Krona specifically. Um, can you comment at all about what the trip might have been like from an area there to the United States? That just getting to a port alone seems when to be When did they come? That really depended on the time. Okay, uh, probably 1890, 1880. Um, by then, they would probably have taken a steamship. Uh, by then, probably through Hamburg, which was the close. This is, yeah, total. <laughs> Um, by then, immigration was yeah, very organized, very streamlined. Uh, just this year, Balin, uh, last year, Balinstadt, the uh, island that Im um, housed immigrants that went out of Hamburg, was opened as a museum in Hamburg. So if you have a chance to go there, it's quite interesting. Um, they probably, um, if it's, yeah, is it 1890s? Uh, yeah. Uh, they would have gone through Ellis Island, um, and depending, yeah, did they go straight to Wisconsin? That's my yeah, most yes. people took the railroad then, and most people had a pretty firm idea where they would go, and the uh, trip was planned out at the start. They had tickets all the way. In fact, people coming from Eastern Europe needed to have special passports and tickets to even get to the harbor, and you have to have a mo enough money at that time when you landed in Ellis Island to be allowed in and continue further. Um, what type of cost would a trip uh, incur? I don't know. I, I can't say. Yeah. It was, however, much cheaper by then than uh, earlier in the, st in the sailing uh, boat days, which allowed poor people to emigrate at that time. Um, yeah. Do you ever see like a lot of names from like immigration papers that are obviously German, but like they're spelt differently. Like it, like uh, the time that I'm specifically thinking of was like on Ellis Island where they would not know how to spell the name, so they just kind of like write it down when they were giving the people their papers to get in. You do see a lot of changes, yes. But uh, actually um, that they were changed at Ellis Island seems to be one of these, uh, the myths. Uh, at Ellis Island they were very correct about correcting, correctly spelling names. Often people write after going through Ellis Island decided to change their name and also, um, yeah, so the, the Ellis Island part is usually not the reason for, for the name change. Uh, the most common ones are getting rid of the umlauts and the, the sharp S character in German, uh, either replacing it by an E or just leaving out. Some people shorten names um, by dropping a syllable, um, anglicizing it, translating it, that happened in the, uh, yeah, World War One and time when people who are called Grün now is, call themselves Green and um, <coughs> Schneider is now Taylor and so forth. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just curious. Uh, during my time in Germany, um, I met a lot of people that identified themselves as Russians. Uh, for, for World War II, when the first generation fled Germany uh, into Russia, and then they had their second and third generations return back to Germany, they still identified themselves as Russians. And the, 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 the true German heritage uh, people that I knew were actually kind of resentful for them identifying themselves as Russians. I just thought I was curious if you ever experienced that before. I assume you talk about the, uh, what they call the Aussiedler. Uh, in the time of the Cold War, towards the end of the Cold War, um, yeah. Germany had a, sp a special arrangement with Russia, where the country would basically buy free ethnic Germans. Um, 
and people have um, had, I think, had to have lineage on one family side to one of those uh, earlier German settlers, actually often going all the way back to the Catherine the Great days or some, some sort of German relationship. Uh, um, they came in in rather small numbers at that time, uh, were accepted in Germany. Um, however, after the Soviet Union fell and the wall came down and a flood of immigrants came from Germany. Also, the di um, different thing, this is now about German immigration, immigration law, they were considered German citizens then rather quickly or immediately, in contrast to people who are uh, of other countries, uh, like especially Turkey, who are sometimes were second or third generation living in Germany and are, and are still foreigners because German citizenship law is by bloodline and not by, by place. Um, so you are what your parents are. Um, so the way I understand it was that these people who came from Russia then were actually, especially after yeah, the Soviet Union failed and they came in huge numbers, um, weren't looked upon that favorably by Germans. They were called Russians by, by Germans. They don't speak German in most cases. Uh, they speak Russian. Um, so there's this anti-immigrant feeling. While they were sort of exotic at the time of the Cold War, that faded quickly and they actually yeah, issues in schools now with the typical you know, problems of having non-German speaking kids in, in classes. So Germany is now had, had to face up, actually in 2005, Germany for the first time uh, enacted an immigration policy, called itself an immigration country, up to that point that actually avoided that word. They always had either guest workers or visitors or foreigners, but never an immigrant. So it's, um, in the 19th century, it was a country of emigration, and now it's definitely a country of immigration. Over 10% of the population is foreign in Germany, actually foreign citizens right now. This is a question of curiosity. When the Germans were chased out of Eastern Europe at the end of World War II, did many of them come to the United States? Yes. Um, in fact, I, yeah, I didn't talk about the 20th century here, but um, that was kind of the last wave of emigration in the 20th century after what were the displaced people. And um, a lot of Eastern Europeans, uh, and among them a lot of Eastern European German speakers came in the, in the 50s. Not as high in numbers as in the 1880s, but after that, if, yeah, I don't have a graph here, but that after that, it's basically flat. The Are they still doing a good job of preserving their architectural heritage as they did 50 years ago, or are they getting, like Americans, easy come, easy go, foot it up and tear it down 20, 30 years later? In Germany? Yes. Um, oh, I think they try, <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot of had to be rebuilt after the World War II, of, of course, and um, it's expensive. But yeah, I think everybody tries to keep things going. Could you comment on the um, Pennsylvania Germans that came in 1683 on the Concord to Philadelphia and settled in Germantown? and also uh, their immigration, um, their movements from Pennsylvania to Virginia and West Virginia and then into Ohio and Indiana? Um, yeah, the um, people who came in 1683 are considered the very first group of German, um, uh, German settlement. There were some German individuals, maybe as far back as, as Jamestown, but um, they settled in, in the Pennsylvania area, and um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, um, with the Amish in particular, um, when they, um, because of their certain self-sustaining lifestyle, they need a certain amount of land. Uh, the growing families um, require them to move on, so parts of the families moved on, and um, the next into Ohio, then Indiana, and in fact, today after generations, Wisconsin. It's uh, the Amish in Wisconsin are the largest German immigrant group coming to Wisconsin right now in, uh, in Green County uh, towards the Minnesota border around Green Bay, kind of there. Mm. Yeah. 
Uh, I was wondering if you knew any of the, um, well, obviously there has to be something written down for you to know this much about the their past. They must have kept a history of it. Was there a history written down about this? or uh, uh, About German immigration? Mm -hmm. Oh, libraries full, <laughs> yeah. Could you Tens name a couple of the authors' names? Um, if you just want a quick overview about Wisconsin in particular, there is Richard Zeitlin's book. It's published by the Wisconsin Historical Society. It's a little booklet. Mm -hmm. It's a very nice little summary. I invite you to take one of our brochures. That kind of, it's, a little, okay. it's not a historical timeline type summary, but it grabs the conce major concepts of uh, German-American experience and traces of it. And okay. yeah, otherwise My I- Grandpa was a big uh, writer downer. He wrote family history mm -hmm. um, from whatever he knew. He researched everything, the grave sites and everything. Mm -hmm. He went back into the history. Um, I thought maybe some of his relatives might have been originally authors. Maybe, yeah. I would look at a library catalog and, yeah. Um, Thank you. And our own library, maybe. And, yeah. Actually, if you, um, I forgot to mention that, um, we have a newsletter here too, and um, we have an email notification list. If you'd like to be notified about our events, you uh, can write the email down if you want to like two or three issues of a newsletter, write your address, it would be great. And if you have any question, my name is on the back of the brochure. Also Kevin Cordillo, our librarian, is extremely helpful with anything. And just to make a little pitch for the library, um, if you ever run across interesting documents, uh, if you don't know what to do with them, never throw them away, give them to some historical society somewhere. Uh, we would still love to see them. If you want to keep them in your family, that is actually the most fantastic thing. If you would like to share them with us, we'd be happy to scan them for research reasons. And yeah. Angie, will you tell us a bit about your experience? My personal experience? Yeah, yeah I've, um, I came here over 20 years ago. I met my husband in Germany, so I'm a classic example of the personal reason. <laughs> I had a perfect great life in Germany and I came, came here. I became a citizen last year, so I'm the first immigrant. I vote for the first time this year in this country. Um, yeah. From California. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Any other question? Thank you. Thank you very much.